So I'm going to finish, uh, let's turn up the blood vessels. The anatomy of the blood vessels will finish the head and neck and go into the upper limb and lower limb. So the dural sinuses basically function as veins and they drain uh, the brain. Responsible to do is to also identify um, the dural septa because that's where they're found. It's kind of hard to see here, but. So, what I'm writing is the dural sinuses are found within the dural septa. Septa, so you need to identify those. They're um, dura mater and connective tissue that compartmentalizes the brain. And what you see in this picture is um, the brain in the cranial cavity, and then when you remove the brain, you see the dural septa in its divisions. You should be able to identify um, the falks, the falks cerebri. in the sagittal plane and it divides the cerebral hemispheres. That's kind of what I'm showing you here. The cerebral hemispheres, um, well anyways, back to the faults. If you look in the superior border of faults, there's the superior sagittal sinus, and then the inferior edge here is the inferior sagittal sinus. So kind of hard to see because they're inside this dural septa, the false root. <coughs> so superior sagittal sinus, I'll put in the Superior border, inferior sagittal sinus. It's contained within the inferior border. Okay, so that's the fox. Same picture, but I'm going to point to something else here. The tentorium. Right there. Uh, tentorium cerebelli. It divides, what was on the picture on the left? It divides the cerebrum above from the cerebellum below. septum that divides parts of the brain, those two things, and if you look in the posterior edge of the tentorium, it contains the transverse sinus. Okay.
Okay, so I have other pictures here. Um, you can also study them in these pictures that show the, <coughs> the dermal sinuses on the brain. So let's start to learn the anatomy here. Um, in both pictures you have superior sagittal sinus, so therefore, what's this one? <coughs> superior sagittal sinus. So you have a much smaller inferior sagittal sinus here and here. Okay. Now some other things. There's a vein I want you to know. It's called the great cerebral vein. All the veins, they kind of end up here in this vein, and it kind of joins the inferior sagittal sinus. And these two merge to form the straight sinus going all the way down here. At this point, it merges with the superior sagittal sinus. And the point where all the sinuses drain into is called the confluence. Okay. Con means with Influence means like flow together. That's where all the sinuses meet. <clears throat> so you have the superior side of the sinus. sagittal sinus you have the great cerebral vein Sinus. The straight sinus merges with the superior sagittal sinus, and the point where they meet, I'm going to call my next thing the confluence of sinuses. sagittal plane, but coming out of the board, uh, they kind of go in the transverse plane. There's going to be the transverse sinus. I can't really draw it. But um, see right there. The name of the sinus is the plane that it's in. It's in the transverse plane. It kind of goes out laterally from the confluence of sinuses, but then it's going to go down. The goal is to drain all of this blood down to the neck, down to the heart. Now the main vein of the neck is the internal jugular vein. So to kind of get out of the skull, it's going to take this S-shaped turn. It's kind of shaped like an S. Um, call it the sigmoid sinus, which means S-shaped. slide kind of has um, what I'm talking about. The point at which they all converge is the confluence of sinuses, then you have the uh, uh, transverse sinus, more it's S-shaped, sigmoid, and it's going to exit the skull via the uh, jugular foramen, and that sinus basically becomes the internal jugular vein. So let me draw this line going straight down. And exit the skull. The hole is called, I'll say, exits jugular foramen. 
And that vessel continues on as the IJB, internal jugular vein. So that's kind of the anatomy, how you uh, drain the brain and get the blood uh, down into the neck, which will go down to the heart. Here's a posterior view of the skull. And you can see uh, confluence of sinuses clearly from the back. Confluence of sinuses, transverse sinus is going to continue down as the sigmoid sinus, but as soon as you see it outside the skull there, it's the internal jugular vein. And that's all you're responsible for. Be sure to study pictures in the book and um, be able to identify the faults of the tentorium. And this model's in the roof right there. We call the model Dura Head, and it has everything uh, you need to see there. So when you get into the neck, you have the internal jugular vein, which is the main vein of the neck. But more superficially, there are two other jugulars that I don't want you to confuse it with. You also have the anterior jugular and the external jugular. Okay. picture on the left, it's, it's an anterior view, basically you're looking right under the jawbone there, and um, be able to identify the anterior jugular vein. Just identify it. That gray tissue is called the cervical fascia, it basically is like spandex for the neck. Um, if you dissect it away, well, we'll see in the next picture, you'll see the muscles underneath of it. Um, so this picture here is a lateral view of the neck, but what you should notice is the external jugular vein, part of it is, uh, lies on top of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, big neck muscle. So don't confuse the anterior and the external jugulars with the internal jugular vein, which is much deeper. The internal jugular vein runs with the common carotid. Those other two that I've listed here on the board uh, don't have a major artery that runs with it. carotid artery and the vagus nerve and what's called the uh, they're all contained in what's called the carotid sheath section and they, they pull the, um, the sternocleidomastoid aside so you can kind of see that the internal jugular vein uh, and the artery and there's nerves in there too. They're um, kind of medial and deep to the SCM, the sternocleidomastoid. Deep slash medial to, I'll call it SCM for short, sternal um, clidomastoid. 
All right, so that kind of concludes head and neck. I want to go into upper limb, lower limb. Now, the remainder, the remainder of the slides to show you the, the models to study. I, I don't want to go through them, just there for your reference. And I already told you that I put links to all the models on uh, Canvas that kind of have me going through the different blood vessels on the different models. So I'm going to go through the different slides that I have. Well, upper lid and lower lid, right now. <laughs> Today we do will have a lot of time to start to study the models. For the blood vessels, and some of you start returning your lab write-ups for the blood pressure lab that we did last Friday. I want to do the uh, lower lid first. The reason why I'm showing you the pelvis, not a lower limb, is we expect students to understand how blood vessels get out of the pelvis into the lower limb, right? Because the artery is in the body cavity, the abdominal aorta, and it has to branch out and get out of there before we can even talk about the lower limb. So let's talk about the abdominal aorta. It's one single tube. If you look at it compared to the vein, the inferior vena cava, it's a little bit on the left, correct? I mean, it's always out of way. It's not a random. Left, right, left, right. And the artery ends by bifurcating right there. That's about the level of L4. by bifurcating at L4 into, um, well, you got two common iliac arteries. Same, same picture. Um, what you can see is that once you get that bifurcation of the two common iliac arteries, there are several arteries that enter the pelvis. Okay. Um, let's see. So let's just kind of list them all. Well, the common iliac will then bifurcate into the external iliac and the internal iliac. I'm going to give you a landmark. Uh, look for ureters. The ureters always cross the iliac arteries right where the common iliac artery bifurcates. vessels <coughs> just distal to where just distal to where the common iliac bifurcates into internal external iliac arteries.
Okay, so at this point, I want to talk about all the blood vessels that enter the pelvis. Most of them will supply blood to things in the pelvis. Some of them will exit the pelvis out the gluteal region to supply blood to the gluteal region in the back. Um, so let's talk about those. So, arteries entering the pelvis are your two internal iliac arteries. The external ones don't enter the pelvis. That's why they're called external. Like the two internal iliac arteries will enter the pelvis. Um, you have one superior rectal artery will enter the pelvis. On the picture, it's right here. This is actually the inferior mesenteric. But it, it's cut off right there. But if it wasn't cut off, it would give off a branch that goes down to the, to the rectum. So two internal iliac arteries. One superior rectal artery. Um, you have one median sacral artery. Now the picture's a little off. Let me go on the previous slide. That's not really showing either. This one should, does show it. There's supposed to be a branch coming up right here where the bifurcation is, right there. Then it'll show that accurately. That red vessel and the blue vessel is the median sacral artery and vein together. I'm just listening to the artery here. So, so far, we'll see if you're awake this morning. How many have we got so far? Two plus one plus one is four. Now, that's it. In terms of males, um, that's it. Now, for females, the gonadal artery will also enter the pelvis because the ovaries are in the pelvis for the females. So for females, we have two gonadal arteries. So that will be six for the female, four for the male. Now we're in the pelvis. Let's talk about the pelvis. And here's um, one slide showing you the landmark I mentioned. This, this will help you when we talk about pelvic arteries. The blue line, the blue arrow I should say, is pointing to where the ureters cross the iliac vessels right where they bifurcate. So if you go before the arrow, you've got common iliac. So if you go to the arrow and then you kind of cross it, after it, this one is not going to be common iliac. It's going to be the external iliac artery. You can't see the internal iliac, it's kind of out of sight here. This picture shows it better. So you follow it back, abdominal aorta, common iliac, external iliac, that's the internal iliac. Okay. So the landmarks always help. Um, so now that we're in the pelvis, let's talk about some ligaments of the pelvis that are going to come up in the gluteal region. So here's a posterior view of the pelvis. There's two ligaments here. I'll write them down and point them out, and I want you to know. They create these foramina or holes to where the blood vessels can kind of like course out and squeeze out the back, basically. Sacrotuberous ligament. I'm sorry. One ligament is the sacrotuberous ligament. It's this big one. Um, bottom to top. All this right there is the sacrotuberous ligament. If you remember your bone surface features? Um, sacral tuberosity, your um, not sacral tuberosity, <coughs> ischial tuberosity, your sit bone right there. So right down. Sacrotuberous ligament. Also, heart is 
see, it's kind of deep to it here, right there, that, one, that leader line. It's pointing to sacral spinous ligament, referring to the ischial spines. Both of those create what are called the sciatic foramina. Foramina is whole. So all right, they create, it's called the <coughs> greater lesser sciatic foramina. Use this picture to help you study. It's a pretty good figure. And um, let's point out our ligaments. It's a lateral view of the pelvis now on the left. Uh, picture on the right is what we just looked at. Posterior view. So from top to bottom there, sacrotuberous ligament. So that one right there, sacrospinous, and it creates this big hole here. Um, that would be the greater sciatic foramina. Well, you can see the yellow, color it in yellow. And then the blue is the lesser one. Now, this big muscle here is actually not that big. It's the piriformis. It occupies most of that space. But the piriformis is also another landmark you should be able to identify because it creates a space right above it and right below it. And blood vessels that you have to identify will squeeze out above and below it, so making the piriformis another useful landmark. People to identify the greater sciatic foramen, piriformis. That's a landmark muscle coming out of there. So, to understand what that landmark is, let's go back and look inside the pelvis. And we'll see arteries that kind of squeeze out above and below the piriformis. And it's shown in this figure, this medial view of the pelvis. Right there. And I'm just showing this to you as a preview. I mean, I don't know if you remember studying this for repro. It wasn't that long ago, but that model does have some of the uh, branches of the internal iliac artery that I want you to know. So that's what we're really talking about here. We do. Let's look at this figure. It starts with abdominal aorta, and your first branch is the right common iliac. So you do have right and left. Okay. Now on a lot practical, I usually don't require you to put right or left. Sometimes if I want you to indicate right or left, I'll actually say, is this the right or the left? I'll say identify right or left. Okay, so of course you have to name the vessel. Sometimes students make the mistake of they just put right or left as their answer because they think that's all I want. I also want you to name it too. Uh, so is that clear on the lot practical? Name, always name the artery, right? That's the name of the game, right? <laughs> Can you name it? And be thankful, that's all I'm asking. I could ask you what it supplies. I could ask you about the course it takes. I just want you to name the thing. I think that's hard enough, okay? And also put right or left if I say so. Uh, okay, abdominal aorta branches. That's the right side. It's the right common iliac. It branches again. The external iliac is going to just continue on out, squeeze out the front of your um, groin area. That's, that's the femoral artery. We'll, get, we'll go back to that. Let's follow the internal iliac artery. It's got a lot of branches. And I kind of put numbers next to all the ones that I want you to know. Okay. Usually how it's broken down is there's like an anterior division and a posterior division. So if you look at the internal iliac artery, these two big branches, anterior and posterior division. The anterior division has a lot of branches, so let's go through them. <coughs> the 
anterior division, let's just follow it. The first branch that comes off of this picture, <coughs> right there, it's kind of occluded there. It's part of the, uh, um, basically, it's the umbilical artery. Okay? Now, of course, they cut the umbilical cord right when you're born, and it doesn't function as that anymore. But there are other branches of it that supply blood to the uh, bladder. <coughs> so let's just know that. It's labeled number four there. <coughs> I'll use the same numbers on the board here. It's the umbilical artery. There's a branch coming off, and it's going to exit <coughs> the pelvis through that little obturator canal and supply blood to the medial thigh. It's obturator artery number five. Okay, there's one little branch coming off here, but he's just kind of hanging out there. It's labeled number seven. That's going to go to the rectum. It's the middle rectal artery. Okay, there's one coming out. It's going to squeeze out inferior to the piriformis and go right behind that sacral spinous ligament and go to the genital region. Number eight is the internal pudendal artery. Now there's a branch of eight that doesn't have a number on it, but it has a leader line. This one is the inferior rectal artery. Okay, so put that as a branch of the internal pudendal that you have to know. Rectal and inferior rectal is the branches here, part of the anterior division. Um, okay, and we're going to go back up to here. It's still the anterior division. This uh, artery is going to exit inferior to the piriformis right there. It's number nine, it's the uh, inferior gluteal artery. Let's go back up even more, the posterior division. Okay, so let's follow back up to the internal iliac, posterior division right there. There's only one branch I want you to know, the superior gluteal artery. It's labeled number two there. So the um, gluteal arteries, everyone in 430 teaches those muscles. The inferior gluteal artery, it's going to supply blood to gluteus minimus, gluteus medius. No, oh, I'm sorry, I cut that off. The inferior gluteal artery will supply blood to gluteus maximus. So apply blood to those other two I just mentioned, gluteus, medius, and minimus. <coughs> so that picture's got them all. And I put some other pictures here that are blank to study. For example, when you study a model, you'll see that there's some variations. Uh, but we have keys, so you can kind of take yourself through it. And I watch the YouTube clips of me showing you how to do it. And whenever you look at a still picture like this, and it's a model, and you can always look for your landmarks first, if I gave you any. For this one I did, here's my landmark. That's the ureter. If that's ureter, if I go above it, I know that's the common iliac. Okay? So here's my landmark. It branches. 
That makes these two things, the external iliac artery and vein right together. So go back up here, this is the internal iliac artery. Here's the anterior division. There's gonna, it's gonna give you a couple of branches like there and there. That's the superior, inferior of the two arteries. For example, this first branch coming off is umbilical. This second branch coming off, I always remember what it is because it runs with this white obturator nerve. That's obturator artery, it exits right there. Um, so again, superior inferior gluteal arteries, that's like internal pudendum. That's what this one shows. This one, I just keyed out for you because like, it's a little different. Okay, for example, they show 339 and 340 as the superior inferior gluteal arteries and they're coming off both the posterior division. That, that wasn't what I showed you previously. Just to show students that Anatomy isn't always going to stay the same for you. So uh, put a star next to this. Study it. I've keyed it out for you. It's just a little different from what you usually see on other models and people because it varies in people too. Well, anyways, what usually doesn't vary is the gluteal region. And if you study that, you have to remove glute max to see anything. This picture here, they cut glute max right along there and they're reflecting it back so you can see the deeper external rotators of the thigh. And again, it helps to know that landmark muscle, remember what it is, starts with a P? Yeah. Piriformis, if you find that, I think you're pretty good. It's right here. And if you see like a little <coughs> nerve bundle, nerve artery vein bundle above and below it, what you should note is if it exits above it, it's the superior gluteal nerve artery and vein bundle. They're all together. picture here, it's like piriformis is it's a hair shaped muscle, that's the name, piriformis. Well, anyways, that those nerve bundles, I mean just look for them, um, I'll just kind of put them as like little <coughs> nerve artery. I'll draw them green for nerve. But, but anyways, if it's superior to the piriformis, it's this one. If it's inferior to the piriformis, it's the inferior gluteal nerve artery vein bundle. Sometimes they're illustrated all together, sometimes they're shown individually, it just depends. On this picture, they're showing you the nerve, the artery, and the vein all together. So I'll just draw them all there. Anyways. The other thing you should be able to identify, even though this isn't a nervous system unit test, is that the big nerve, it's the biggest nerve in the body, it's sciatic. It's right there, it exiting inferior to the piriformis with the inferior gluteal nerve artery vein bundle. What I also like about this figure is it shows you how, for example, the inferior nerve artery and vein bundle, it's kind of like innervating the glute max. And on this picture here, you can see how the, the branches of the superior gluteal uh, artery are supplying blood to gluteus medius. Okay. 
For example, if you have a picture, unlabeled, and you can recognize the landmark, then the arteries are easy. Let's start with the, the nerve. That one. What's that? That's sciatic. Here's my landmark. That's piriformis. Therefore, if that's piriformis, what's this one? Superior gluteal artery. Inferior gluteal artery. Okay. So landmarks make it easy. All right, so now that I've taught the umbilical arteries, remember that? That's a branch of the internal iliac. I can finally teach fetal circulation. Okay, so I know it's kind of an odd place to put it, but um, I'm supposed to teach this in the heart chapter, but I don't like teaching it until I've taught that blood vessel. Right. So now that you know about heart and blood pressure, we can kind of look at fetal circulation and it makes a little more sense. So this is kind of like a little aside here, and how I usually teach fetal circulation is I teach basically how it's different from adult circulation. There's two differences. One is, in a fetus, you're in water and you're not breathing. So you can bypass the lungs. There's not a lot of pulmonary circulation. Okay. Also, baby isn't using the digestive system, so you don't have to have a lot of blood supply to the liver. So there's all these bypasses in fetal circulation that the adult has that the fetus doesn't. Um, so let's start with two bypasses of the lung. One is right here. It's the foramen ovale. So what you got here is, in the fetus, it circulates one way, and then as soon as you're born, the circulation changes. valley is a hole in the heart. It's in the interatrial septum. Well, they show it right here. I mean, they point to it like right there. I mean, it's kind of hard to see. Uh, I had to identify fossa ovalis on the heart test. Okay, and um, anyways, the fetal circulation that is it's open. It's like a flap that's open, and um, blood always follows the path of least resistance. If it's hard to flow somewhere, it won't flow there. It'll, it'll go to the path of least resistance. The thing about it is, um, when baby is in utero, the lung tissue is filled with fluid, okay? So there's a lot of resistance to blood flow there. So instead of wanting to flow to the right heart and flow to the lungs, there's too much resistance. It just wants to go through that flap to the left heart. Specifically from right atrium to left atrium. So the foramenal valley is a hole in the septum between right atrium and left atrium. So when it's open, blood flows from, I'll just say RA to LA through that hole when it's open. Okay. So essentially, by doing this, you're bypassing the lungs. And when the baby is born, uh, takes the first breath. When you hear a baby cry, it's a, the best sound because you know he's breathing, right? Uh, takes first breath, then lungs fill with air. It provides much less resistance to blood flow when the capillaries are surrounded by uh, air sacs. But, and so you just follow the path of least resistance, you'll actually just want to go to the lungs more. Okay. And then, so that flap will close, and we identify it as the fossa ovalis, a little depression in the right atrium. So, so newborn foramen ovalis becomes fossa ovalis. Another bypass is that structure located between pulmonary trunk and aorta. It's right there. In a newborn, 
Well, I had to identify it before as the ligamentum arterioso. I think you remember that from the sheep uh, heart dissection. The fetal circulation, that ligament is actually an open blood vessel, and it's a connection between those two things. It's, um, it allows blood to flow from the pulmonary trunk to the aorta. So when it's open, blood flows from one structure to the other, and you, you bypass the lungs. If you go straight from the trunk to the aorta, you never get to the lungs, right? The lungs bypass. And again, the same thing happens. You get that pressure change when you take the first breath. And then blood preferentially flows to the lungs and not through the ductus arteriosus. So it kind of like shuts, becomes that ligamentum arteriosum, the newborn. Uh, the la last bypass right here, it's a bypass of the liver. Now, when it's open, it's called ductus venosus, and blood is allowed to bypass the liver because it will flow straight from the one umbilical vein right to uh, the inferior vena cava, and hence you bypass the liver. Normally, blood will flow right to it through the um, <coughs> portal vein, but it's not in fetal circulation. So the bypass is you flow from umbilical vein right through to inferior vena cava through an open ductus venosus. Bypassing liver. And when it's all um, the newborn, that structure becomes unused. You actually do get blood flow to the liver and it's called Ligamentum venosum in a newborn. And it closes up. Uh, the last thing I want to show is the two umbilical arteries that I just taught as part of the anterior division there. The branches of the internal iliac, and you can see in a newborn they're used. I mean, blood is flowing away from the baby from the, to the placenta. Okay. So there was the in a newborn, they be, those arteries become <coughs> ligaments. abdominal wall, I mean, they're not really used, but they do have branches in a newborn that supply blood to the urinary bladder. And so we still teach it as a functional artery for that purpose. <clears throat> Just not the umbilical cord purpose, that's no longer used. Okay, so field circulation uh, done. I finally got to the umbilical arteries there, and now I'm going to go down to the rectum. And I already mentioned all three of them, but um, I kind of did it here, there, and uh, it might be hard to cherry pick them from your nose. What I want you to know is the three rectal arteries, well, at first it tells you that the rectum has a lot of blood supply. It also tells you that, um, well, well, one thing of clinical significance, hemorrhoids is kind of a failure of the um, rectal veins. Okay, they kind of distend, that's hemorrhoids. But um, I want you to know 
the origin path of the three rectal arteries. Because they all come from different places, so it's a little confusing. Yeah? Passing, bypassing the lung, they should have the oxygenated blood from the mom, yeah? Yeah, the, all the oxygenated blood is coming from the umbilical vein. Oh. It's not coming from the lungs. Yeah, there, there's a lot of blood mixing there. You got a question? Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the first part. When the newborn takes their first breath. Yeah. Oh, does it drain all the fluid from the lung? So you're asking where that fluid goes? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. No, not about that. The baby's Yeah, I mean, they do help the baby when he's, there's certain things that they do. So, I have a question. So, uh, for sometimes, yeah. like, when, be, when it doesn't close, that can be mm -hmm. start to have, like, serious issues. So, maybe a surgery. Yeah, they can do surgeries for that. Usually, you can you can you can live with that. They call it a hole in your heart. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you'll, you'll get some blood mixing. I mean, when you do a, a surgery on a very young infant, the blood pressure must not be good. The oxygenation must not be good. The blood pressure and oxygenation are okay. They can probably just let it go. So it all depends on uh, that. It's always the doctor's call. Mm -hmm. The parent has to make a hard decision. Sorry, yeah, I don't know where the flu goes <laughs> when we take the first breath. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Oh, yes, so the first vessel coming up there is the superior rectal artery. Superior rectal artery is a continuation of inferior mesenteric artery. Okay, that's where it's coming from. Oh, it's a continuation. It's really a branch of it. A branch of inferior mesenteric. Coming off way up here, it's inferior mesenteric. It gives up a lot of branches to your distal colon. But when it gets way down here, it's the uh, superior rectal. Okay, the other one was the middle rectal. It's right there. Remember, the uh, middle rectal was part of that anterior division of the internal iliac. It's a branch of the internal iliac artery. And let's remember that the inferior uh, rectal is a branch of the internal pudendal. have one model that shows the superior rectal artery, but not the others. Uh, I point to it there. This artery, there's this uh, inferior mesenteric artery, but that branch down there, going all the way down to the rectum, is the one you should be able to identify in the model. So, let's see here. Okay, so, kind of done talking about the pelvis, rectum, and gluteal region. I want to talk about the artery that kind of squeezes out the anterior aspect. I want to teach you the femoral triangle, which is shown here. This is the front of the thigh, going up here to the groin area right there. Uh, these are the structures you should be able to identify. When you do a dissection, 
and you remove the skin and subcutaneous tissue, what you see is the fascia lata, and there's these blood vessels deep to it. But this saphenous opening is kind of um, where the femoral vessels are. And the great saphenous vein, it kind of drains into the femoral vein right there in the groin area. This is a male. There's this spermatic cord. But the gray sap in this vein, it, it starts from medial ankle, runs all the way up the medial aspect of the lower limb, and drains into the femoral vein right, right up there. So that's what you should be able to identify. Gray sap in this vein is the longest vein in the body. <coughs> I think they still use it for bypass grafts in heart surgery. Look for it on the medial aspect of uh, lower limb. I said it, it drains into the femoral vein at the saphenous opening. So you have to remove the fascia lata to see the full femoral region. Uh, in, a, in an area called the femoral triangle, okay? and that's kind of shown the picture on the right. So what you've got is a triangle roughly shaped like this, trying to match that femoral triangle. Well, anyways, this border of the triangle is the sartorius muscle. The sartorius muscle form this lateral border. Now, the, the medial border here is formed by, um, let's see, the adductor. Not adductor magnus, adductor longus. Sorry. Adductor longus right there forms this medial border of the triangle. And then the base of the triangle is formed by a ligament called the inguinal ligament. And it's really the contents of the triangle that contain the important things. From lateral to medial, it's the femoral nerve, artery, and vein. So be able to identify that. So you got the the moral triangle know its borders, three borders, and three contents. The moral nerve, artery, and vein. So that's three structures, all with the same name, femoral. to medial, and that's the cut vessel of the great saphenous uh, vein right there. And we do have this kind of shown on models, so you can kind of study that region. And um, so the femoral artery is the major artery of the anterior thigh. And so if you study its origin, you go right back up to the abdominal region where you have the abdominal aorta bifurcate in the condyliac. And then it bifurcates again, and one of those branches is the external iliac, and that's the one that exits uh, what's called the subinguinal space, just inferior to the inguinal ligament, and continues on as the femoral artery. So I always look for the femoral artery to pass right by the femoral head, okay, the head of the femur.
So femoral artery. It's a continuation of the external iliac artery. And once you see it pass by the femoral head, it's femoral artery. Okay? It's going to give off one big branch called the deep femoral artery. Now, on this figure, they call it profunda femoris, which means deep. But to be profound is deep. So I just call it deep femoral. It's, it's easier. The deep femoral artery gives off two branches that actually wrap around the neck of the femur. And they're called uh, the medial and the lateral circumflex femoral. They wrap around the femoral neck. I'll break those as branches. Medial circumflex Moral artery. Lateral circumflex femoral artery. Now, if you go back to the femoral artery and follow it down, it's going to go from the front of the thigh to the back of the knee. And so it's go through this little adductor canal. I'm going to, I'm going to like show you the bottom half of this figure here. So if you follow the femoral artery down, now we're kind of close to the knee here. It's going to pass through this structure here called the adductor hiatus. That's literally a hole or a tendon of the adductor magnus muscle. It's going to pass from the front to the back. Now it's in the back of the knee. <coughs> from all artery, from following its course, uh, passes through adductor hiatus. is the popliteal region, back of the knee, okay? Posterior knee. So I've got a couple of pictures here. You can't see it, but now it's behind the knee. The popliteal artery will branch into anterior, posterior, tibial arteries. And since we're looking at it from the front still, you can see Post, uh, the anterior tibial artery right there is in between tib-fib for the most part. There's an interosseous membrane between tib-fib, and at the top of that membrane there's a little hole. And that's where it branches posterior to the knee, and one of the branches pops out the front. It's the anterior tibial artery. Right there, and you got to look for it on the leg. Okay? You have to remove one of those muscles, and this is the anterior uh, tibial artery. Just to show you that branch point, here's the posterior knee. Your kneecap is the um, patella, right? But the posterior knee is like this, this depression called the popliteal fossa. back of the knee to protect the arteries. So that's where the artery is. So in the popliteal fossa, look for the popliteal artery and vein. By the way, they run together, but the popliteal artery back there, it'll uh, bifurcate into anterior, posterior tibial arteries.
So to, to follow that, um, those notes on the picture there, as you pass through that abductal hiatus, it's down the popliteal artery, you get that first branch, that branch going through the interosseous membrane, it's gonna pop out the front, it's the anterior tibial artery. The one that stays on the posterior tibia is the posterior tibial artery. So the um, arteries are basically named for the bone, right? The tibia is the weight-bearing leg bone, if you recall. So again, that area where the bifurcation occurs is the popliteal fossa. You have a vein that's also called the popliteal vein, and the popliteal artery is with it. I won't test you on the nerves, but they're there. If you recall the sciatic nerve, it branches into the um, common fibular and tibial nerves, but don't worry about that. Be able to identify the blood vessels there in the back of the knee. Okay. Popliteal artery and vein. It's easy because they have the same name as the region. So where they branch, I point to it here in the picture. You can barely see it there. There's a muscle called popliteus muscle, and just right inferior to it is when they branch in the anterior posterior tibial artery. So it's always useful to kind of learn where arteries branches. And those will take you all the way down to the foot. So what I want to do now is go back up to the upper limb and talk about the blood vessels of the shoulder. Finish up here. We got upper limb, lower limb. There's a nice picture of our upper limb models, and we have a lot of them. There's a picture of one of them. The upper limb has different regions. You got the shoulder, you got the armpit, or the axilla region. And so a student should learn what the axilla is. Okay, it's literally your armpit. Now to see the axilla, you have to abduct the arm. So when your arms are abducted, you can't see it, right? So um, you got these folds. A fold is basically skin with muscle under it. So the anterior fold, you primarily got pecs, right? Pec major, pec minor. Now this posterior fold is important. There's some landmark muscles in there. It's mostly lats and teres major. Okay, teres major, you can follow them right there. On the lateral wall, we'll basically have the humerus bone. You have this groove called the medial uh, bicipital groove. On the medial wall, it's ribs, and the muscle would be the serratus anterior. So that's kind of the, what we got there. Now, when you have the arm adducted and you can't see the axilla, the armpit, you just have the shoulder region. There's, there's one the vein you got to know. It's the cephalic vein. It's very superficial. Um, It runs through the deltal pectoral groove. It's the first vessel of the upper limb is going to be a vein. Groove between delts and pecs, deltal pectoral groove. And I pointed out on, on the model, on the picture on the right, the students um, commonly confuse that with the ax axillary vein. It's not. It's the cephalic vein in the deltal pectoral groove. It's very superficial. If it were the um, axillary vein, they would usually show the axillary artery with it. Okay. This vein has no major artery that runs with it in that groove. Okay. So, able to identify that vein. Here we have a um, picture of just the model itself. Here we have a picture from the atlas showing you the axillary artery with the axillary vein cut, by the way. Okay. Axillary vein cut. And so to orient you with this, um, it helps to first know that the axillary artery is a continuation of subclavian, and that you kind of have to know its limits, where it begins or ends. The confusing thing is, 
as you probably figured out now, the, the artery doesn't change, it's just the name, right? It's the same tube, it's just changing its name. So, axillary artery limits. The axillary artery is a continuation of the subclavian artery. The, the axillary artery begins where the subclavian ends, which is lateral border of the first rib. That's kind of what they do. You can't really see it in this picture, first rib, so I just kind of point to where it would be. Begins there. Runs in the armpit region, or the axillary region. There's a muscle here that's going to help us. That's the cut tendon of the pec minor. We're going to use that muscle. So it keeps going, and then it ends there. That is where the um, you have the inferior border of the teres major. That's kind of where it ends. That muscle marks the end of the axilla. So it marks the end of this artery. you have the pectoralis minor, like it's like a bridge over this artery. That's why I use this picture there. But the pectoralis minor, it creates three parts of the axillary artery. So you have a, well, you know, one, two, three, three parts. The first part is medial to the pec minor. The second part um, is deep to the pec minor. And the third part is lateral to it. three parts to the artery. <coughs> and now those three parts Let's just call it first part, second part, third part. Now there's a lot of branches in this uh, artery. And um, the first part, second part, third part all have branches. Um, only want you to know the branches of branches of the third part. And it so happens the third part has three branches. Let me show it here. The largest branch of the axillary artery of the third part is the subscapula. It's the one that kind of, well, I'll just point to it right here. branch here. Now the other two branches, they wrap around the surgical neck. And they're, they're illustrated disconnected, but they're usually formed, they're usually connected around the surgical neck. And they are called the um, anterior, posterior, circumflex femoral. Okay? They're just like the medial lateral circumflex femoral arteries, except they're of uh, the humerus. Anterior circumflex humeral artery. Posterior circumflex humeral artery. They wrap around. They 
wrap around the surgical neck. So know those three branches of the third part of the axillary artery. And for example, I have a picture of a model of the man on the green board. And I have little black arrows here pointing to those three branches. That's posterior, that's anterior, circumflex humoral, or process of elimination. What's this one there? Subscapula. Okay. So I know that's the third part. And um, so just remember that uh, subclavian, get to the lateral border of the first rib, it then becomes axillary. Okay. I drew a blue line where it would mark the insertion of the. Uh, teres major, you pass the inferior border of teres major, and then it becomes brachial. So one artery, three names, is just the name that changes. And so if you know your landmarks, I'm like, for example, since I know that these are the three branches of the third part, I put a line there, because after that you have brachial. And I put a black line here, because I know that's the first rib. So I know I got subclavian, axillary, brachial, okay, for the upper limb. If we take another look at the upper limb and look at this model, uh, I want to teach you three superficial veins. And what I did was, what's confusing the students is, you have all these vessels right here, and they're all blue. Therefore, do you think they're arteries or veins? Veins. They're all veins. And so all the veins you see in your skin, they're all veins. These superficial veins with no accompanying arteries. So where are the arteries? They're on the bones. Right here, like on the radius and the ulna. So they're there. And those deep arteries have veins with them too. So let's talk about the superficial veins, for example, shown here. They're just skin deep, they're on top of the fascia. And you have cephalic, the same as the cephalic vein running in the pectoral root. But it actually starts here on the hand. It runs up a lateral aspect of the upper limb. So it's cephalic all the way up. And the basilic is on the medial aspect of the arm, runs all the way up the medial aspect of the upper limb. So write down cephalic and basilic veins. And in the crook of the elbow, where they draw blood, right here, median cubital vein, they kind of connect there. So no, three superficial veins. medial aspect, cephalic vein is more lateral, <clears throat> and the third one is where they draw blood, is the median cubital vein. <coughs> so it's in located in a place called the anti-cubital Fossa. So it's basically the front of the elbow. Kind of like the back of the knee is the front of the elbow. The popliteal fossa or the cubital fossa. Okay, so those are some superficial veins. Um, talk about the arteries that are much deeper. We'll start with the brachial artery. This is the artery of the arm. And so the arm is in anatomy is the region between the elbow and the shoulder. And there's a little groove here called the, um, well, yeah, it's actually incorrect. It's the, me the median bicipital groove, okay. not, not bicipital groove. Lies in the medial 
occipital groove name because well that big muscle is the biceps and it's on the medial aspect of the arm. So if you dissect away the skin and the fascia, you can see the brachial arteries. Okay. And there's a you know median nerve that runs with it. Well, anyways, so where it begins and ends, it begins where the axillary artery ends. So its limits begins the uh, inferior border of teres major. about an inch past the cubital fossa, the, the, front, the front of your elbow. It's going to end by bifurcating into the, um, the radial and the ulnar arteries. You see that next. Here's a picture of a muscled arm that kind of shows that, but what I want to show you is an inch past the cubital fossa, right around there on that picture, then you got, well, very simply, radial and ulnar arteries. The names are easy to remember because they're named after the bones of the forearm. Okay, so they're on the, the respective sides. So when it ends, Brachial artery bifurcates into radial and ulnar arteries, named after the radius and ulna. As you, should, you know, always say to you know, put the thumbs up, rad. You know, that's rad. That's the radial side. And you'll never go wrong. So the cubital fossa, just looking at that, dissect away the skin, you can see our three superficial veins in this one area that I want you to know. Cephalic, basilic, median cubital vein connecting those. If you, um, I don't, I'm not gonna test you on the muscles, but where you put the stethoscope to hear the blood pressure sounds, remember that right there is the brachial artery, okay? You dissect it away, you can see the brachial artery and the median nerve running with it. If I just put all three next to each other uh, for study, you can see that the superficial veins, well, they're in the subcutaneous tissue right there when you cut them away. Now, when you get to the distal forearm, I guess the question becomes, can you tell the radial artery from the ulnar artery? So which is on the thumb side? Now they cut the fingers off. Can you tell which is the thumb side? This one or this one? That is. That's the phenar eminence, those big muscles in your hand right there. If I tell you that's the thumb side, what's that artery? Radial artery. Radio artery. See, it gets easy once you know what you're looking at. Okay. All right, so that concludes all the material for your tests that are coming up on Friday and Monday. So we're going to take a break. When you come back from lab, the only thing that's due today is what? Remember? Some of you didn't turn up your blood pressure lab, so that's due today. Some of you already turned it in, you're done with that. And um, you should use um, the remainder of the time to study models. And Wednesday, I'm just going to have, have it be the study day. No lecture, no quiz for Wednesday. Just come study. Because your test is Friday, lecture exam 4. And when's your lab practice? Monday. Monday. Okay, so you guys know that's good. See you after break.